What a wonderful God we serve, amen? Amen. I don't know, I just... I I know that heaven's going to be even better than that, but I just don't understand how, you know? Like, I just, when when we worship together and when there's like... You, you know what I'm talking about. When, where's, when there's that move of God in this place, I don't know. It just, um, it's something really special. Like it's all my cha- most cherished memories, I think, are in this place, other than marrying my wife and the birth of my children. Like I just love being here with you. I cannot express enough what a joy and an honor it is to call you brothers and sisters. It's just a wonderful thing to be in this place with you this morning. Um, we're going to get into the word. I I just always have trouble preaching when we worship like that. I don't know why. Like, it should be easier. But I just have very, it's difficult for me to just even express how I feel. The beauty of the love of Jesus Christ. The power of the Holy Spirit on our lives is beyond words. What he has done in my life, what he has done in in the lives of many of you, it just makes you want to break down with tears of joy right here in front of you. I just, he's so good. He's so good. Um, We're going through this series, Ask Me Anything. Um, I told you last week, I was kind of surprised that we had a... uh, I was expecting like crazy questions, like worldly stuff that I'd be preaching through, and it hasn't been. It's been all theological stuff, and it's going to continue today. I'm very excited about that because I love talking about these things. Um, Today is a, uh, on the face of it, I think it's a simpler question than the last couple that we've talked about, and that's okay. So uh, Old Testament versus New Testament, which one should I listen to more? Which one should I pay attention to more? And this is a really valid question. Uh, it comes up a lot, and this is a big book, right? So I think a lot of times as new believers, we can look at this and say, there's a lot here. Where do I start? What's most important? Give me the Cliff Notes version. Uh, I think that's, that was my, uh, my thought in the beginning, at least. Like, oh, I don't think I'm going to read all this, but I'll try. But can someone give me some pointers, some tips? And so that's kind of what today is going to be about. Uh, We will discuss that question, Old Testament versus New Testament, and we'll discuss what I think is more important. Um, And yeah, we'll we'll go there. But uh, I do want to just give some background information here as well. Um, The the Bible says a lot about itself, okay? There's a lot of scriptures that have specifically to do with the Bible, and they've all proved true in my life. You know, a lot of times when we talk about apologetics, which is just... um, Defending the faith with other people. They say in apologetics, when you're defending the faith, you should never use scripture to prove scripture, okay? But in the house this morning, we're, we're all believers here, I hope. I hope that we all have some kind of biblical basis. If you're not, that's okay. This sermon will still be relevant to you. But this is what the Bible says about itself, okay? We actually talked about this last week. This is where we ended our sermon, uh, oddly enough. Isaiah 55, 11, So shall my word be that it goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. More other, other variations say, it shall not return void. It shall accomplish the thing that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing. And so when God puts out a word, it's a seed that won't return to him void. When I put seeds in the garden, there's some of them that just are not going to grow, okay? There's some of them that aren't going to accomplish what I set them out to do. God says, when I send out my word, it's going to accomplish exactly what I said it will do. Amen? So there's power here in these words. These words have been seeded into the world through our Father, through His Son, Jesus Christ, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well. And it's not going to return void. There's power here in the Word. Hebrews 4.12. This is kind of Old Testament, New Testament. Okay, That's what we're going to do this whole way through. Hebrews 4.12. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and no creature is hidden from its sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And so whether you're a believer or not a believer, we'll still stand naked before the Lord someday with only the word of God. 
We're going to have to answer how we lived our lives according to this book. There's going to come a day. And this thing, this thing is sharp, sharper than any two-edged sword, it says. Piercing not, the, not just to the division of the body, but piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit. These words have power to penetrate deeply into our lives and transform us or destroy us. I've seen it both ways. Psalm 119. How can a young man keep his way pure? Women, this applies to you as well. By guarding it. Guard your way according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so it's important for us to take the Bible, to take the word, and apply it to our lives. It says, store it in your heart. The command from God was to talk about it day and night, he told Israel when they were first beginning as a nation. Remember that? Speak to your children about it. Talk about it when you're on the way, when you're walking to work and back. You know, talk about the word. Store it deep in your hearts. You need to get these. This, this book needs to be deep in here. I've heard stories of, of Christians in other nations, persecuted Christians, and they don't have this book. They would get smuggled in every now and again. Someone would, some, someone would have a Bible and another person would go to that person's house and they'd turn to Matthew chapter 7 where they laughed off last time and they'd write down two more verses, just enough that it, would be, it wouldn't be discernible if the authorities had caught them. And they'd take that word and put it in their pocket and go to the, the church meeting and they'd read those two verses and everyone else would copy them down on the paper, go home and memorize them and throw them in the, in the toilet or garbage can or dumpster or whatever so that they wouldn't be caught with it. But they took that word and they stored it in their heart. And I think you and I have this opportunity, this amazing opportunity. It's like that Christian, average Christian owns like 15 Bibles or something. They take that word, they take two verses and they store it in their hearts. We have this whole book, access to it all the time in more ways than ever before, and we just ignore it. I think what a travesty. And at the same time, what an opportunity for us, right? To have this access to it. We live in a nation now where you don't even have to be able to read. Every single person has a smartphone. You can download the Bible app and it reads it to you. Like, how easy is that? You could take, put the same two verses in Matthew and just have it repeat over and over again a hundred times until it's stored up in your heart. What an awesome opportunity that we have. But the word is important, is what I'm trying to get at. This Bible is important. This is how we live our lives. Amen? Sorry. Main points throughout the Bible. This book is, is not just a collection of stories, individual stories, although it is that. It's not just that, though. There are 66 books here, and they're all telling one story, one overarching story. And so I, I kind of fleshed out what I think are the five main points that the Bible is trying to make, the story that the Bible is trying to tell. And then we'll go through individual parts of the Bible, and I want to show you that God is just telling that same story over and over again. That's all he's been doing, because we haven't quite figured it out yet. Like through millennia, we're still trying to figure out how do we get back to this mighty God? How do we get back to the creator of the universe? How do we reconcile ourselves with him? That story has evolved over time uh, through this book and deepened. I shouldn't say evolved. It's deepened over time. Same story, just more details. Went from cliff notes to the full novel. You with me? Point number one. We're created by a perfect God. This God that we serve is more awesome than we could ever imagine. Some of the words that we say are that he's omnipotent, that he's all-powerful, that he's omniscient, that he's all-knowing, that he's omnipresent, that he's all places at all times. Like Those are all concepts that when we talk about in our mind, it's very difficult to comprehend that a being could be that great. Our God is that great. Our God spoke. And in an instant, everything was created. That was amazing when we only knew about the earth. That was incredible, right? Like when you were a child and you learned that God created everything and you looked around you and you were like, everything? How could one person create that? Well, now we have telescopes that can see like light years, millions of light years away. And we can see it all. All of that, he spoke and in an instant was created. 
It's way bigger than you imagine. He's way bigger than we imagine and way better than we imagine. Number two, we rebelled against him. Adam and Eve, we see it right in the beginning, right? Two chapters of perfection. And then it all tumbles downhill. I don't know how many chapters are in here. I think it's like, remember? Yeah, it's a lot. It only took two to screw it up, okay? And we didn't show up till the second one, okay? <laughs> we rebelled against him. Not just Adam and Eve, but every one of us. Point number three. God is still, still loves you. God's love for you is beyond our comprehension as well. He loves you more than your mama loves you, more than your daddy loves you, more than anybody on this earth loves you. God loves you with an everlasting love. God has grace that renews every morning. What a blessing. He desires for every one of us to be reconciled to him. That is the desire of his heart, but he's given us a choice. He's given us free will. God calls us to turn back to him, point number four. He desires that relationship. Not only does he desire the relationship, but he calls us to turn back to him. He offers forgiveness to everyone. Number five, God changes those who choose to live their lives for him. He transforms us. It's in our church mission statement. Amen? Our mission as a church is to transform individuals in our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I say over and over again. That's who we are as a people. That's who God is. God is a God that brings transformation wherever he is invited. You invite him into your life, your life will be transformed. We invite him into our community, our community will be transformed. We invite him into our nation, this nation will be transformed. You see the pattern here? We see it over and over again play out throughout history. When people turn away from God, when they reject God, things go poorly. When they invite God in and turn to God, things go well. We see it over and over again in this book. We see it over and over again in our lives. We see it over and over again in world history. Are you with me? That's the five main points that this story is trying to tell. Now, the, the Bible is split into different sections. Many people split it up into different sections in different ways. This is your like Bible survey course this morning, okay? So if you're a new to believer, you're new to the Bible, uh, this is where we're going to spend just a tad uh, of our time today. So we have the, what they call the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, or the books of Moses, some people call it. And so it's Genesis through Deuteronomy. It's the first five books. It's kind of the, they, what we call the law. When they talk in the New Testament about talking about the law, they're talking about the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses. And so the, a lot of people don't like reading it. They like to read Genesis. Exodus is kind of a fun story. You get to Leviticus, and a lot of people start to turn their ears off. Uh, Numbers, it gets actually even a little bit more dry. And then Deuteronomy is this nice um, thing that brings it all together. But I would encourage you that each one of those books, there's value. That don't, don't listen to what you've been told about Leviticus and Numbers. They're still worthwhile. They're still valuable, and they still need to be read. Amen? Judges. There was a period after that where Israel now entered into the promised land, and they entered into a period of judges. And in a way, Moses was the first judge, right? Uh, God placed Moses over the people when they had a dispute, then they would go to Moses. Moses would settle the dispute, and um, Moses had a brother-in-law that said, hey, this is crazy. You can't handle the dispute for two million people, so let's put other judges in place. They can handle the little cases, and we can handle the big cases. And that's where our Supreme Court was actually modeled from. That's how we handle law in our nation as well which is modeled by the rest of the world. Amazing, right? So there was that period, and then Israel said, well, God, we don't like your system. We want our own system. All the other nations around us have kings. We want a king too. We're tired of the judges, so give us some kings. And God says, uh, or Samuel, the final, the final judge, said, uh, that's a bad idea. Don't do that. Samuel pleaded with the people. And they said, no, we want a king. And God said, okay, Samuel, quit arguing with them. We'll give them a king and see what happens. So Israel got kings. And it went downhill from there, mostly. Uh, some kings were good, some kings were bad, just what I talked about earlier. 
when the kings turned to God, the nation did well. When the kings turned away from God, the nation did poorly. And ultimately, they were taken over. Within that period, um, well, the poetry uh, is kind of a section in the middle of your Bible. A lot of times, if you open right to the middle, you'll have kind of some books of poetry. Most people consider the book of Job to be a book of poetry. You have the Song of Solomon, you have the Proverbs, and you have the Psalms and um, Lamentations are all books of poetry within the Bible. And so they are um, they're wisdom books, things that we can read and get an idea of who this, who this God character is. Not only that, but who are we as people? Um, just a lot of really good stuff in there. Throughout the period of the kings and after, there was a period of the prophets, okay? So God sent, when the kings were there and the kings went the wrong way, God would send a prophet to try to set things right or to at least go and proclaim the truth of his word. So the prophets would go out and proclaim the truth. Many of them were killed. Jesus talked about that a lot. And after the final prophet Malachi, there was a period of several hundred years where there was silence. No prophets, no voice from God. And it probably seemed to the nation of Israel at many points that God was, had forsaken them. That God was not active anymore. That God didn't love them anymore. And then we have Jesus. Through all that darkness, through all that silence, Jesus enters the scene. We have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which gives us four different perspectives. We talked about this a lot. It's a past sermon series, if you want to uh, listen to that one. What was it called again? Does anybody remember? Mark, help me out. Okay. We can't even remember what we preached. I can remember what I preached. I can't remember what it was called. It was poor marketing is what it was. Uh, no, anyway. So the Gospels, then we have after the Gospels, Jesus dies, ascends to heaven, and Holy Spirit enters the scene. And then we have now the church age. That's the last couple there. We have the book of Acts uh, with all the churches, and then we have uh, the epistles afterwards, which are all the letters. So letters from uh, Peter, letters from John, letters from Paul that make up the whole rest of the end of the Bible. Okay? Y'all with me on that stuff? That's kind of your Bible survey. That's the story. And then those five main points that we talked about, this is the, these are all the story that happened within those. Now, I would argue that you could take any one of those sections of Scripture. If you just had any one of them, you could still tell that same story. The story is complete still in the book of Moses, books of Moses. There's still this way of redemption. There's still God. There's, God is still changing people who live their, live their lives for him. We see, uh, we see even in Moses' life, right? Moses was not this like natural, gifted, charismatic leader. But God changed him and altered him. As, as Moses submitted his life, God was there. And we just see it expanding and deepening as we move through the Bible. So about the Bible itself, if you don't, like I said, if you only had those parts, it tells that story in each of those parts, and then it also tells it on the, a macro level, micro and macro both. There's no better place to read than any other. I don't believe in the Bible, okay? There are certain books that are more densely packed with information. Um, I certainly have my, my own favorites. When someone asks me where to start, I normally tell them Matthew, I'll tell them John, I'll tell them Romans. Um, then after they've read through those, let's say go back to Isaiah and read Isaiah, James, just a few of my favorites. But honestly, it's like every time I read through the books again, I'm like, oh, no, that's my favorite. And then I'll read another one and be like, oh, no, that's my favorite. It's like watching your favorite TV show, you know? And every episode after you're done, you're like, oh, that was so good. And the next one, you're like, oh, that was even better. And you go back and watch the first one again, you're like, oh, no, that was the best one. That's how I am with reading the Bible. It's like every time I read it, I'm like, hey, more stuff is revealed to me. It's, it's a deeper relationship with God as you go. But the fact that the Bible is even here today is a miracle in itself. We have uh, no book has ever been more attacked or reviled. Um, looked up, uh, there was a quote from uh, Voltaire. He was a uh, French philosopher in the 18th century. And uh, he said that he was going to go through the Bible and disprove it all. Or he said he was going to go through all the trees in the Bible and basically cut them down one by one. And by the time he was done, there'd be nothing left. And he said within 100 years, uh, the Bible would just be a relic in museums. 
that it would be dead. Well, here we are 250 years later. And the Bible, in many ways, is more alive than it's ever been. No. Nope. Not a good dude. Uh, Karl Marx. Theories of uh, communism, the original uh, communist manifesto. He says, religious suffering is at one point, at the same time, the expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. That's what he said. He said, this, bi this Bible is just a drug to numb us to the pains of the world. And once communism would take over, then wouldn't need it anymore. We'll just get rid of it. And we've seen how that played out over and over and over again with genocide after genocide, failure after failure, because when you turn away from God, it doesn't work. And what's really funny is he looked at Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 and said, that's how communism is supposed to work. If we just cut out that God and that Holy Spirit stuff, it'll be perfect. Well, it turns out that's the only reason it works, Okay. That's the only way we can be selfless. That's the only way that we can be giving to each other is through the power of God. So it can't be forced upon us. It's something that we have to choose. Amen? The putting together of the Bible was a divine process. Can you imagine? There were no printing presses when the Bible was written. We're talking copied down by hand from generation to generation. Not only do we have it all, it survived to get here. That's amazing. There are many, ma many manuscripts of like famous older books where they found like two copies. The Bible, they found thousands of manuscripts. And by and large, they all agree. It's the same stuff. As you would expect, there's little spelling errors here and there. There's one word replaced with another, but on the whole... We're still telling the same story here. Uh, they actually, they, a lot of people think that the Catholic Church just kind of came together and decided what was going to be in the Bible, but they had really stringent uh, requirements for what was going to be in there. Because there was a lot of other, other Gospels that were written that were just not at all in, in uh, context with the story. And so they went through, they had a number one say, does it agree theologically with what the Old Testament teaches? And then number two, their other requirement was time. If you were going to make it into the Bible, it had to be written by one of the apostles who was with Jesus or one of the people that was with the apostles. And if you weren't in the first two generation of Christians, your writing did not make it into the, script, into, uh, into the Bible. And, so they, and they had to trace it back to the first century. They had to have a manuscript from the first century. Otherwise, it didn't make it. And so, uh, so they were, it was really stringent that they had done that. Um, it just makes it even more of a miracle. We're talking no internet, no electronic communications, and they pulled all of this together. It's divinely inspired. There's just no other explanation to me for how this came about. And then the proving of the Bible is continually happening. History and archaeology just continue to prove more and more that the Bible is true. And it's so funny when it happens because you like read the article on Yahoo or wherever that you read it, and they'll always try to frame it like, well, it says it's in the Bible, but that doesn't mean the Bible is true. Like over and over again, every single time. That's just how they frame it. It's so, it's so fun to watch. But 1947, just one example. I'll give you two examples. 1947, the Dead, Dead Sea Scrolls were found. It was a really big deal because in the book of Isaiah, maybe we'll just turn there real quick. Let me just read this to you. I have just a little extra time, I think. All the time in the world, right? I'm always told, stop looking at the clock. <laughs> this, is a, this is the description in Isaiah chapter 53. What an incredible thing. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted, acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely has, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him not. 
smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his stripes we are healed. And all like sheep we have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he, not, he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb, he is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who, can, who, considered, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of his people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yes, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief, and his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And so, I don't know, I, don't, I just read that, and it just sounds just like the crucifixion. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was brought the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his stripes, we are healed. It's just this description of exactly what Jesus did for us. And the they, uh, people trying to disprove the Bible in the early 20th century, they were beginning to say, well, because people will always use Isaiah and say, well, matches up Old Testament, New Testament. This has to be Jesus. And they said, well, Isaiah must be a forgery. Isaiah must have been written afterwards, and they wrote their own prophecy about Jesus. That has to be the only way that you could get such a description that would exactly match what the gospel lays out. Like, it couldn't possibly have happened that way. Well, in 1947, God brings the, these two like, herdsmen to find this cave in the middle of nowhere, they go in the cave and they find the Dead Sea Scrolls and they were dated through two, three hundred years before Jesus was born, proving the time period of Isaiah, 400 years before Jesus, was true. And so it's like over and over again, they come up with this, uh, this theory on how, how it's not true, how the gospel's not true, how Jesus was a lie, how Christians were liars and made everything up. And over and over again, even through history and archaeology, it's proved. This was another interesting one I was just reading about uh, this weekend. It was called the Moabite Stone. And they found this stone, once again, just this random person in Jerusalem. There was a missionary there in 1868. And he recognized this stone for that was from the Moabite kingdom. And so he really wanted to get the stone, and, um, but they wouldn't sell it to him, or they wouldn't give it to him. He didn't have the money to buy it. Uh, they wouldn't give him the Moabite Stone. And so he got them to agree that he could make a copy of it. And so he, he made a copy of the stone. You can go to the, uh, what's it called, the Louvre in France? You can go there and you can actually see the copy of the Moabite stone. The people that found it thought it would be more valuable in pieces. So they broke it up and then sold it in pieces to everyone so they could get more money for it. I don't know if that's, I don't know why they would do that. <laughs> Couldn't possibly have been true, but evidently that was the thing to do. This, this stone talked about uh, the time 850 BC, which we can actually look at in 2 Kings chapter 3. I'm not going to go there now. But it records the battle between the Moabites and the Israelite kingdom. And it records the Moabite uh, side of the, of the scripture that we see in 2 Kings chapter 3. And so you can go to that Moabite stone, and you can go to the Bible, and we're talking now, uh, how long ago? Almost 3,000 years ago. And it agrees on the story, word for word. I mean, it's different sides of the story, so you can imagine. It would be like American telling of the Mexican-American War and a Mexican telling of the Mexican-American War. Obviously, you're going to have very different perspectives. But they're telling the same story. I thought, how interesting. But we're still finding these things all the time that exactly agree with, between history and the Bible. And so, so what do we do with all that? With all that in mind, why would you want to just focus on one area of the Bible? Why would you want to get rid of the old when it proves the new? 
Why would you only want to read the old without the full completion of it? And so I think we have to, we have to take it with a balance. And I think what we're really getting at here is that this is all readable, accessible for each one of us. I had to look up, how long would it take you to listen to the Bible, read it? It said at pulpit rate, I guess, was the, is the standard for reading, which I think is pretty slow. At pulpit rate, it takes 70 hours and 40 minutes to read the Bible. That's if you read it aloud slowly. It takes 52 hours and 20 minutes for the Old Testament, 18 hours and 20 minutes to read the New Testament. Even the longest book, Psalms, will take you just over four hours to read. If we break that down into daily reading, we're talking about 12 minutes of your day to read the entire Bible in a year or to listen to the entire Bible in a year. I don't know about you, but I can waste 12 minutes really, really fast. 12 minutes, and you'd get the whole story every single year. The Word of God, the one who spoke all of creation in, exist in existence in a, in a fraction of a moment, you can get to know the full story that he's trying to tell you with 12 minutes a day. Why are we not doing that? We have this Bible reading list, which will take you about 12 minutes a day to read, coincidentally. Three chapters, an Old Testament chapter, a chapter from the Gospels, and a chapter from the Epistles. That's how we have our reading plan set up. You can pick one up with your bulletin at the beginning of every month. So next week, there will be one for August in the bulletin that will lay out three chapters for you to read every day. I don't care how you read the Bible every day. That's just one way to do it. But the fact is, you've got to take it all in. All right, back to our main points. I'm going to end here. I'm going to try not to go into too much detail. Because I, oh, I could just preach all day on this. Number one, we're created by a perfect God, proved by the Old Testament, and then John chapter 1, proved by the New Testament as well. This is old and new, coinciding together. This is John now. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so we have this beautiful picture in, of creation in Genesis, and then here in John chapter 1, we have this beautiful picture of recreation, of our regeneration, that we've been born again. Amazing. Same story, we just add the depth in the New Testament. Because we have Jesus now, right? We know the rest of the story. It's so much deeper than it used to be. Second one, we rebelled against him. We see that with Adam and Eve. We see that in Psalm 53, says the fool, says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God, and they have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. That's Psalms, okay? Romans chapter 3, many of you know, says almost the exact same thing. But now, it's depth deeper though. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. So it's not just that we've fallen away from the law, but God's doing something different from the law. It's something deeper, wider and deeper. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Just what I've been saying, right? The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is available through Christ Jesus. Same story, deeper and wider. God loves you and is rich in mercy. He desires for every one of us to be reconciled to him, so much so that he makes a way for us. Amen? The Passover, you know the story of the Passover? All the firstborn were supposed to die. But God said, Israel, you take the Passover lamb, slaughter the lamb and put the blood on the doorpost, and wherever the blood is found, I will pass over that house, and my judgment will not, will not be on that house. And so all of Egypt, they all lost their firstborn sons, and Israel, wherever the blood was found, they had protection. It's pretty obvious to see the New Testament in that as well, right? Now we don't have to kill lambs and put the blood on our houses, praise the Lord. 
Now we have the blood of Jesus Christ that covers each one of us. If we will accept him, if he will take the blood and put on the doorposts of our life, so to speak, the house that is our life, then God's judgment will pass over us because it was already, all the judgment went on that lamb, right? Same story for us. All of our judgment, all all that we deserved can go on Jesus Christ if we will apply the blood. Four. God calls all of us to turn back to him. He offers forgiveness to everybody. See, it wasn't just the Israelites this time. It is deeper and wider and deeper again in the New Testament. Now the blood is available to everybody. Now the story is available to everybody. We look at Lot. Remember Genesis chapter 18 where Abraham starts to uh, argue with God about Sodom and Gomorrah? And he says, God, if there's just 50 righteous people in there, will you still destroy it? God says, no. No, I won't, even if there's just 50. What about 20? What about five? What if there's just one righteous person in there? Will you still offer mercy? God says, yes. Yes. How about Noah? God saves just the the one. He cares for just the one. He could have flooded the whole earth and just started over again on his own, right? But he doesn't allow anyone that wants to accept him to be turned away. Everyone who desires mercy, everyone who desires the grace of God can receive it. He calls all of us to turn back to him. He offers forgiveness to everyone. This is now... um, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing. He changes those who choose to live their lives for him. It was true for Moses. It was true for David. It was true for Paul. It was true for John. It's true for me. It's true for you. You want to live your life different? You want things to change? You want your attitude to change? You want your words to change? You want your thoughts to change? You want your actions to change? It can all be changed through the power of Jesus Christ. He's still in the business of transforming. I'm a living testament. You guys know my story. Called out of alcohol and drugs and called out of all the worldly things that I did. God changed me. It was like overnight. I still, when I still explain it to people, I still have trouble explaining it. Because I can remember weeping and asking God for forgiveness. I cried myself to sleep. And when I woke up the next day, it was like Paul, when the scales fell off of his eyes, I went outside that morning, and I can remember, and it was like the grass looked green for the first time. It was like the sky was blue for the first time. It was like in Wizard of Oz, you remember when everything is black and white, and then all of a sudden everything's in technicolor? That's how I felt like my life was. Just overwhelmed with thankfulness for what God can do in somebody's life. He can do that for you. Found a scripture in First Peter. I just this is the last one. I promise. I just thought this has all five of them right here. He was the found. He was <clears throat> he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. This is Jesus now. Peter's talking about. So there we have point one. Right. We were created by a perfect God. Jesus was there in the beginning. This perfect Savior for us but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Why does he have to make it manifest for us in the last times? Because we've all fallen short. So God sent his son to save us at just the right time. Who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. 
There we have God is rich in mercy. He makes a way for every one of us to be with him. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. There we have God calling us back to him and those who will obey, those who will follow his truth are the ones who will be changed. And then we see the change. For a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again. God is still in the business of transforming people. You were born again not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flowers of grass. The graph, grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. That's right out of Isaiah chapter 40. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So we have here all five parts of the story of the gospel. We have here a reference from the New Testament to the Old Testament, proving once again that it's all important, that we shouldn't leave anything out. And then we have this uh, beautiful uh, picture, not a perishable seed, but imperishable. When God sends out his seed, it never returns void. He doesn't send out a dead word into the world. He sent out the living word into this world. If we will plant this word into our hearts, we will see a harvest of righteousness. We will see a harvest of transformation. You with me? Have I preached enough at you? Or do you want me to keep going? I'll stop. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this question, Lord, that we could take this time and just kind of go through your bi your, the Bible that you've given us, the word that you've given us, and just be able to tell the story that you've told us. Lord, I pray that as we read, that you would widen our understanding, give us a greater knowledge of who you are, and that you would deepen our understanding, that our minds would be transformed, that you would place these seeds deep within our heart. And Lord, I know that when we place the living word in our heart, that it will not return void that it will reap a harvest of righteousness 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Lord, help us to be a people who will plow the ground of our hard hearts and will place the seed that you've given us. Lord, if there's anyone in this place that does not know you, if there's anyone in this place that is still living in the black and white world that I described, if there is anyone in this place that has not yet experienced the salvation for you. Lord, with every eye closed, with every head bowed, would that person just raise their hands right now that we could just pray a prayer of salvation over them? Is there anyone in here that needs to receive Jesus today, that needs to receive a good word, a good seed, that could reap a life of righteousness? Raise your hand if that's you this morning. I just saw one hand, and that's okay. That's a beautiful thing, actually. And so, Lord, we just pray right now for that hand that was raised. Lord, right now that you would just place a seed in the heart. Lord, the word says that when we repent, which just means to turn away from the life that we've lived and, to, and make a decision, we change our mind to follow you instead, that you will change us. Lord, the only other part is that we need to believe in you, that we would believe that you are truly the Son of God, that we would believe that Jesus really did come and save us. Lord, if we'll just repent and believe that you'll change and transform us. And so I pray that over my, my sister's life right now, Lord, that you would just be in her life right now, that you would lead her and guide her in repentance and belief. And Lord, that she would walk out of here a new person, that she would walk out of here living life in color that the grass would be greener, that the sky would be bluer, and that she would be made brand new through your power and your grace. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the blood poured out. Lord, we thank you that this story didn't end in chapter 3, like it very well could have, but that you made a way for, made a way for us through Jesus, that you offer us changed, changed lives and change destinies. We just love you and we thank you in Jesus' name.
Amen. As you go from here, don't rush out. Uh, there's a whole family here for you to greet and get to know. Uh, so make sure that you uh, shake some hands, hug some necks, get to know each other. We are family after all. Amen.